when you go in to talk with these people to turn them into an asset, though, which is obviously a huge part of what case officers do, there seems to be two ways that that happens. Listening to you, listening to Jim Lawler, some other guys on the internet who talk about this. You either A, do all the things you just said to develop trust and then find a, a that vulnerability thing that makes them feel like, you know what, this guy's got my back. I will work with mm -hmm. him, right? And it, in a way, manipulatively inspires them to work with you. There's that category. Then the other category is you find their you find their weak spot. You find not the vulnerability I was just talking about. That's a weak spot, but I'm saying like their weak spot, like you get information that other people can't know and you got to make them in into an asset. What does that conversation look like? I mean, we've taught, we've already covered, people can listen to you yeah, yeah, yeah. on other podcasts, talk about how catching people with pattern of life and stuff like that. We, we don't need to go down all that again, but like you're going after somebody, some high level guy that you need to make into an asset for the CIA. This is like a direct mission. Like Andy, we need this guy. And you find out that, you know, he has this vulnerability, whatever it is, and you got him. Is it like in the movies where you walk up and you're sitting at the bar and then suddenly you're like, you know, we know about that, right? <laughs> or is it much more like friendly and, and calm and like not necessarily saying the obvious, but getting the point across? It's no, it's very much about saying the obvious. So what you're talking about there is the difference between what we call a warm approach and a cold approach. A warm approach is a relational approach. You find their vulnerability, you make everybody feel like they're friends, and you make everybody feel like they're warm and cozy, and you do all the mirroring stuff I talked about. All the stuff you don't want to talk about, that's all warm approach. What you're getting at right now is what's known as a cold approach. And a cold approach is usually very heavily centered on some uh, on a motivation that we know is coercive in nature. And I think I've told you about the four different motivators in the past, right? One of the four motivators is coercion. I know you're in debt. I know you're cheating on your wife. I know your son's dying of a rare form of cancer. I know that whatever, right? I, I know that the mob is out to kill you and whatever else. I have some piece of information that you have that you don't, ta that you don't share with anybody. Right. You've probably also heard me talk about our three lives, public life, secret life, and private life. I have some piece of information from your secret life that you don't share with anybody. And now I'm coming up to you and I'm very, I'm, I'm still being cordial when I step into the bar and I say, hi, Julian, how are you today? And you look at me and you're like, I'm fine. <laughs> have we met somewhere? And I was like, no, but I'm really glad that we had a chance to meet today because I understand that you're in a situation with your son right now and that you're having a hard time finding any place that'll give him the medical attention that he needs. And I'm here to tell you, I can solve that for you. I can have your son in front of a doctor that's going to give him life-saving medical care within the next six months. But what I need you to do for me is X, Y, Z. And most people are going to give me a look that's like, because they're frozen. In the, in the hierarchy of how people respond to strangers... There's three phases. Okay. There's an avoidant phase, a competition phase, and then there's a phase where they comply. Avoidance, competition, compliance, right? Those are the three phases. Everybody starts from avoidance. So when, when you hit on a cute girl or when a cute girl says something nice to you, there's a reason that you stand there and you just go, because mm -hmm. you're in the avoidance phase. You're not engaging her. When you compliment a cute girl and she looks at you like you're crazy... She's in the avoidance phase too. She might actually think you're cute. She might actually like the compliment, but her natural human instinct has her in a position where she's not going to talk and she's not going to engage because the first phase is avoidance. So I'm expecting that when I tell this person, I can save your son's life. And I know that you've been trying to do that for the last six months and we're going to have it fixed within the, within the year. I'm expecting that person to look at me and be like, fuck you. Who are you? I don't know what you're talking about. Right? That's the avoidance phase. As we continue to push on that, and I tell them, look, the life-saving care that we have is waiting for him in a specialty hospital in, Mar in Maryland, inside the United States. I can have all expenses paid, and we can have your entire family there, you know, before the fall. Then I expect to go into a competition phase. Who are you? Where did you get this information? How do you know about my son? They might even get up and try to leave, right? They're showing me that they're actually curious about the information. Try to leave. But they don't get to leave. Right. How do you keep them there? Like, you don't have to keep them there. The information, the pitch, the coercion, that coercive element that you've, ins that you've put in there, 
you already know it's strong enough to get them to stay. What about the 10% of people where it's not, though? The ten percent of situations where they walk out of there, then they could just go like tell like, "Yo, I just got approached by a CIA guy." That's true. But you know what happens more more often than not in that ten percent, they come back to you. They come back to you. But in the meantime, do you have to get out of the country because it, the heat might be on you? No, because you're you've not got, nervous. You've got that person's. <laughs> when you're going to approach somebody coercively, you have them on lockdown. You're listening to their phone. You're watching their email address. You watch them walk into that location. You watch them when they leave that location. You're co you've got them pinned down. The reason you're taking this level of effort is because it's worth it. You don't put yourself at this much risk unless that person is so worthwhile that you're willing to bring in, not just you, but you and your team and your supervisors and everybody at Langley, they're all like, yes, this person is important enough that we're going to commit these kind of resources, right? Is there a chance that someone's going to go to their boss and be like, I just got approached by CIA? Of course there's a, there's a chance of that. But then what happens to them once they tell their boss that? Uh, well, if they're in the wrong country, that could go the wrong way. That could them. go the wrong way yeah. quickly. So now all of a sudden the boss is like, how did CIA know about you? How did they know about your son? Your vulnerability. Your vulnerability. Yeah. We need you out of this job. You just lost your this. You just lost your that. So they don't want to tell anybody about that. So what we're doing is we're putting them in a double coercive vice. There's our coercion where we're saying, we know you have a problem. We're your only option to fix it. And then if they do have the, usually it's not good sense. Usually it's some sort of panic reaction where they get up and they, they shuffle their stuff all together and they leave the bar. <laughs> 10 minutes after they left, then they have the real oh shit moment where they're like, oh shit. Like, what do I do? I can't tell my boss. I, I can't tell my wife. I can't tell my son. I can't look at myself in the mirror. All I've got is hopefully the business card that we gave them right before they left. If you change your mind, call this number. This is where like I'm one of those cynics that thinks that anything I see in the movies, it's like, I, there's no way it's like that. I'll still ask the questions, yeah. you know, because it's like, well, there has to be some truth somewhere. But like you're talking about this from the situations and I can see you like picturing some of these in your head, just like the way you're explaining it. Like you're reliving some of them, which is pretty wild, but you're talking about these where you're the one going in there and, and telling them this stuff. But you, you know, you're you work with other case officers at CIA. I've heard you talk about being a support on mm -hmm. missions and things like that. You know, is it literally sometimes where like someone walks out of that meeting and then another guy, let's say it's another case agent in there with him, and another guy like you shows up at his house and says, "Oh, it's a nice dog you got there," and walk like does you that change happen? Your mind? <laughs> no, 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 no question. Just like that's that's a cute dog, and then walk away like that kind of thing, like that type of intimidation. No, there's no reason to intimidate. So, so you got to think about all this stuff through a lens of operational security, also. Right, because we're trying to protect the officer. Your average CIA officer has sure. gone through about two point five million dollars worth in training, but they're still just a fleshy sack, right? A, a bullet, a knife, a car, a bat is going to do real damage <laughs> to your two point five million dollar human asset. Yes. Right. So we're always judging things through a lens of operational security. So when when we know that we're when we know there's a target sitting in a bar, and we know that we know more about the target than they know about us. That's a scenario that we call information superiority. So we can walk in there and we can launch a surprise attack and basically pitch them on a cold approach to solve their biggest problem. And we can anticipate that they're either going to have a conversation with us right there or they're not going to have a conversation. They're just going to leave, right? We also know roughly 75% of the time they're going to stay. 25% of the time they're going to leave. So we know that we have to give them a... a a card with a phone number or something so that if it's 25% of the time and they leave, when they have the oh shit moment 10 minutes later, they have a number they can call. <laughs> we also know that we should sit at the bar for 30 minutes. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. But once that 30 minutes is over and they've left and they haven't come back and the surveillance team outside has called in and been like, hey, that dude went straight to the police department. Or the surveillance team outside is like, hey, that dude called his wife right away and told her the whole story right away. Now we're like, oh, okay. That, that was a wash. So now we should take some back off. You know, uh, uh, we should plan for, for uh, blowback. Yeah, get you out or something. If, if it gets to that, yeah. If there's like a police report or something like that, or if we might look at getting somebody off the X. Is there retribution for people to do that? Is there retribution? Their son now dies? 
Well, there's some. You guys make sure of it? No. <laughs> there's no benefit there. I had to ask. There's no <laughs> benefit. Because the benefit, dude, the benefit is that that dude sits there and watches his son. I mean, this is going to make me sound like a horrible person, but this is what life looks like outside of the rules. Yes. Every day that guy faces his son. Every day he watches his son disintegrate more and more. And every day he knew, he knows he had the chance to fix it and he didn't fix it. Mm -hmm. And that, that is where the coercive part of this sets in. Because after doing that for 10, 15, 30 days, 60 days, two years, he's still gonna keep that card. And when the day comes that he picks up that card and he makes a phone call to that number yeah. and he says, hey, I had somebody talk to me about helping my son. Can I have that conversation again? Someone's gonna say yes, right? That's what it's all about. If we're gonna take the step, if we're gonna put the effort into the cold approach at all, then you're gonna have the effort to take the follow-up. Like it's, it's worth it. The risk is worth it because that person is so special. What happens in Hollywood, dude, is that out of 100% of cases, we'll cold approach maybe 5%. 95% work. Oh, I believe that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you yeah. know what? Hollywood doesn't like the 95% because then it just, it's too boring. Like, oh, you become besties and you go out to dinner and then you start talking about families and then you start doing this and you start doing that and that's not sexy. I don't think that's boring. Well, a lot of times in Hollywood, it's hard to develop that story accurately. Interesting. So it's way, more, it's way more entertaining when the guy walks into a smoky bar and he drops a suitcase of cash and he pulls a gun up underneath the table and he says, hey, you're going to talk to me and you're not going to leave. That just sounds more entertaining and exciting. But then it's quick and it's over and it's one thing. I actually think you're onto something here. I think it's more entertaining. Like when you have someone where you think they're that guy, like if you're, wa if you're the viewer watching it, I'm just thinking about this. And like you're watching two people become friends, you have no idea one of them is like a spy. And then suddenly like the day comes in where it's like, oh, sorry, I'm a spy. <laughs> That's good TV right there. Thank you for watching the video, guys. Please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.